Okay, so I'm talking about geographical models, geometrical models, topological models, graphical models, and spectral models. So this, this is the most abstract that you are not going to deal with in this course. And this paper that I just mentioned um, is actually about this most abstract models of space. But there's a, there's a gradient from the most concrete ones, which are the geographical models, to the most abstract ones, which are the spectral models. But so as you go down, then they get more and more abstract, right? So a geometric model, something like a model that you make in, in AutoCAD or Rhino or any other um, geometric modeling software for that matter, is going to have most probably um, objects with local coordinates in your coordinate reference system. So the zero, zero, zero point, there was a question in the other uh, session about um, the, the reference for the, the origin of the coordinate reference system or the necessity um, as to um, why we need to um, use a plane when placing objects in a space. That is exactly the point. So whenever you write a vector with coordinates, that means that you are implicitly or explicitly referring to a coordinate reference system. So zero, zero, zero should mean a point in space, right? So in geometric models, these, uh, these uh, coordinates are going to be local with reference to that coordinate system, coordinate reference system, or there can be more than one uh, local coordinate system. In topological models, however, then you're not dealing uh, so much with coordinates, you're not even bothering with dimensions and angles even. So you are mostly dealing with such matters as connectivity, uh, continuity, closedness, and so on. Right, I will get to this topic um, soon enough. But just for your information, there will be a next lecture, which is about uh, graphical models of space. There is also the same time term reserved for uh, other types of graphical models in, in um, statistics, if I mistake not. But here we are talking about models of space. So models that um, replicate the structure of a space in terms of its connectivity, um, in terms of objects with pro proximity links or similarity links are the subjects of graph theory, which will be the subject matter of our next talk. Yeah. So as a, as a refresher, I will recapitulate what, what we talked about last time. So the concept of a manifold that I talked about in the last lecture is actually a topological concept. So you have already been exposed to some extent to this, uh, to this subject area. Well, for the same reasons that we can call these two objects two-dimensional, even though they are three-dimensional, and um, even though they have some differences, um, we, can call, we can at least see some similarity between them in terms of dimensionality. Um, um, we, we, can, we can study them topologically for those same reasons, yeah? So what, what is the study all about? So as I said, um, in, the, in the actual practice of computer graphics, computational design, or any, any sort of geometric modeling with computers, you will be actually dealing with these kind of discretized models, regular grids and irregular grids, or regular meshes and irregular meshes. However, it might be more intuitive to start um, understanding the, the concepts in topology with reference to the to the good old continuous uh, constructs or abstractions of space. And then we will quickly shift our gear to, to understand the topological constructs in their discrete form. So the topological matters when, when pertaining to the continuous world are yeah, perhaps more easily understood with referring to point set topology uh, and its abstractions. And these kind of abstractions can be better understood by referring to algebraic topology. So these terms are um, a bit tough, but we'll get to those. So my purpose from, uh, for this lecture is to convey to you the intuition behind these topics, and we'll have enough time for getting to the gory details of the matter of topology later on in the course of the workshops, and you have quite um, a few or actually several examples of how to deal with topology in your geometric models in code. So do not worry about um, the hands-on part. 
you'll cover totally. So it's important that you get the idea first. So um, as I said, topology is, uh, I, as I've written in the lecture notes, it has grown much bigger than, than, um, than what it used to be in, in its, uh, in, at the time of its inception. So it, it was um, um, kind of started not so long time ago. It's as compared to other fields of mathematics is a, a, is a relatively new field of study, new meaning that it started only in 18th century or so. And as I said, it's uh, sometimes considered as the so-called rubber sheet geometry, or I would prefer to call it dough geometry, referring to baking dough, um, because it only concerns itself uh, not with uh, dimension, uh, not with dimension as in size and angles and such matters, but it concerns only uh, itself with connectedness, continuity, closure, and dimension, as in dimensionality. So therefore, sometimes it is considered, uh, yeah, dimensionless geometry. But dimension is used in two different senses in these uh, descriptions. One is dimensionality in reference to the manifold dimensionality, the dimensionality of this object. This could be a piece of dough, which was initially a donut, then was transformed slowly and gradually into a mug. Yeah, you can, you can do this. If you have ever baked anything, you know that you can easily do this. And again, if you have baked anything in your life, you know that attaching this handle to this mug, if it is made up of dough or clay, is not as easy as just shaping it with your fingers into something else, right? So uh, strangely enough, this is a term that I haven't coined. Uh, such transformations that you see on the on the screen are called topological transformations. I find it actually a very unintuitive term because the term itself suggests that we are actually ch changing or altering the topology of the object. But um, this is one of the weirdest things about some mathematical descriptions, but just accept it from me that a topological transformation is actually a transformation that does not change the topology of an object, right? As I said, I didn't make this term, so I just have to accept it and explain it to you, okay? But in, in actual reality, it's very simple. So, um, so long as you transform this object with your fingers and you do not cut it, uh, you do not pierce it, you do not glue something to it and so on, you are performing one form of a topological transformation. It's a smooth transformation. It's a one-to-one one one transformation. And it's kind of reversible easily, right? So you can read this cycle in, in either direction, counterclockwise or clockwise, yeah? You can convert a donut into a mug and a donut can be converted back into a donut without doing any of these things that are not allowed, without cutting, without making holes without gluing pieces, yeah? So that should give you an idea as to what topologies are about. So um, maybe I've read the riddle from the lecture notes. If not, just think about it once again. If you were to make um, a t-shirt out of a piece of dough, a t-shirt or some kind of a cover for something you're cooking, yeah? How do you have to do this? How can you do this? And do you see what I'm trying to get at? You have a piece of dough, you have rolled it as a disc, you want it to make pizza, then you change your mind, you, you, you decide to make something else with it and you want to make a t-shirt for, for, let's say a vegetarian chicken, and then you want to cook it like that, right? So what do you do with a piece of dough? But really as a t-shirt. Um, you should have holes to fit your arms and head through, I suppose. Yeah. So that means the three holes. Three holes. Okay. Perfect. So then you get your t-shirt, right? Yeah. The rest you you can shape with your fingers, and that would be totally fine, right? So this is the only trick that you need to change the topology of the object to make it some kind of a t-shirt. So as far as I'm concerned, this is a topology of a t-shirt. So can you now imagine what would be the topology of a, of a, of a pair of trousers? If you decide uh, to make uh, trousers. 
So this could be uh, trousers for, for a cartoonish character, right? Everybody sees the point, right? So the same way you can also make trousers for that uh, poor vegetarian uh, chicken, yeah? And then you can make a complete set of clothing, right? Okay, so you, this is what I like about topology. I believe that everybody has, 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 has a built-in intuition for it. So let's activate it from there. Uh, I told you also a little bit about this matter, the distortion and, and the, the fact that the other types of geometry that you have probably not been introduced in high school mathematics or primary school. And that we, if we generalize the, the, the idea or the notion of something like a triangle or a line even, then you can see that even though the, the shapes change from one kind of geometric representation to another, for instance, in geospatial modeling, the topologies can stay the same, right? So let's say, do you know about the little prints, the, the book from Antoine de saint exupéry right? So he had this little planet, yeah, so let's say there's, a, there's another prince on the same planet and they have two plots of land and they are neighbors, right? So if you take this, this little planet and you want to make a map out of it, right? There will be definitely one way or another some distortion of geometry, right? But you can keep the same kind of connectivity or adjacency or neighborhood between these two in your rectangular map. So let's say this is a North Pole, this is the South Pole and you do some little trick and you make a rectangular map here and then the, the two things end up being here and here, like this, yeah? So the geometry has definitely changed, yeah? I'm not disputing that fact. In fact, there's one way or another, some kind of a distortion in any map that we make, even geograph in the, even the most so-called accurate geographical map, there's some distortion, but the topology can stay the same. But what, what's the point of all this? Well, I don't know about you, but I would find it much easier to, to deal with neighborhoods and, and uh, constructions on this rectangular map rather than this one directly, right? So especially if you're designing something, then you have actually one very important reason to work with this kind of topological representations in their most simple form, in their simplest form on such simple representations, because as far as you're concerned, the information content about the connectivity is here, right? So that's why we like so much these kind of simple abstractions, topological abstractions. So you might find, find the topic a bit uh, scary or annoying even at first, but believe me or not, um, I hope that you believe me, it really makes life simpler from this point on. Yeah, if you understand what topology is and if you manage to utilize it, okay. I, I think you already see one, one reason why it is important. So, um, and for your information, I've also mentioned in lecture notes how these things can actually naturally arise in, in, in computational designs from, from shape optimizations. Uh, you can easily get into uh, these sorts of geometries from this one, then again, that's one more important reason to, to work explicitly with, with topology is to be able to transform these objects from this form to another while keeping their, their connectivity the same. So something binds them together while you're transforming them. That, that binding agent is actually the topology of the object that you have to explicitly model, right? You will see very concrete examples in this lecture how, as to how this is done. But, um, I'm not going to bother you with these details because I've, I've put my best words for explaining these in, in the lecture notes, but let's, let's get to this once again together. So this is another picture which pertains to, as I said, that a different sense of, uh, well, there, there are multiple senses of the term topology. One is the so-called point set topology, which is the general topology, which is described, um, as I said, to, um, to help us model explicitly such properties as connectedness, connectivity, and also dimensionality, or let's say for now, the, the general shape of some complex object, which I would prefer to call a manifold at this point. Yeah. 
So this is a very general application of topology, which is called topological data analysis. Um, and I've searched for hours for, for, the, for the most perfect picture that can actually pertain to this definition. And if you read a little bit more about this, then you see that many mathematicians actually agree that this is one of the most elusive and most abstract definitions in mathematics. And again, I didn't make it myself. I would have preferred uh, uh, if it were somewhat simpler or more intuitive, but I've tried my, I've done my best to make it as intuitive as possible. So then the most intuitive way I can explain it to you as this. So if you were to explain what these points have to do with each other, and this is a general question that uh, frequently occurs in data analysis. So you have a bunch of, um, pairs of coordinates or tuples of coordinates that you could call data points. These could be um, data points or data points that, that uh, have coordinates with, uh, with reference to, as um, I mentioned in the previous lecture, some preferences or some uh, quantities that describe your, your choices in life, for instance, as, as far as a uh, grocery store uh, from which you always uh, do your shopping is concerned, then they want to know what are your preferences uh, when it comes to choosing food, right? So they want to they want to be able to predict your next purchase, right? Or they have your profile and they have someone else's profile and they want to know who else might be in between you two. And then let's say want to arrange their, their shelves and their products to serve best their customers. This is, this is an exemplary application of this matter. So they form 12 dimensional vectors and then, then they have um, these vectors as data points. And then usually there is something that connects these data points together, some, some similarities and some connections that can connect them together. And how can we detect similarities? So if you say that, well, each of them has a radius of distance, Euclidean distance, generalized Euclidean distance around them, then you can say if the two balls pertaining to two points kind of intersect, they're connected to each other. And then you can form this little graph here. I hope that it is clear from this picture, but there's a little graph of connectivity between them. But even if you don't see the graph, well, you see it here, you can just um, um, keep your eyes slightly open and have a look at them from, from a distance. And the question is, what do you see in terms of similarities or the bigger picture in between these points, right? The point is, if, if you think that they, they, they have these larger radio, radii of similarity, then what you see from this picture might be a donut in the form of a donut, right? In this one. If you're too far away and, and you think that when it comes to similarity, there, there can be bigger radii of similarity, then you actually see just one big ball of objects that are all similar to each other, right? So the, the easier you, you accept that two things are similar, the, 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 the simpler this shape will be, right? If you sharpen your definition of similarity and, and consider a smaller radius, then you will begin to see some kind of a double donut or a triple donut. So there's one hole here, one hole here, and one hole here. Right, and so on and so forth. Then here you see some, actually some disconnected components and one donut connected to something else, which is more of a graph, right? And so on and so forth. So this, these are the subjects, but what is behind the curtain, uh, well, mathematically speaking, is that we are thinking about intersections and unions of these objects. And we want to model these intersections and unions uh, with the help of the language of sets. I will get to that definition uh, soon enough, but before losing focus, let me, let me just tell you why we are first looking at that picture, because as I said, there are two senses of topology that are relevant to your, to your um, studies in this course. One is point set topology, which is the, the first picture that I started with the things related to the big picture, the piece of dough that you have, the, the, the piece of dough that you can see between those points. 
how is it connected? Uh, what is the shape in terms of continuities and uh, connectedness structure? How can you best describe it if it were made out of dough? Does it look like, sorry, does it look like a ball of dough? Does it look like a donut? Does it look like a double donut, et cetera, et cetera? So these are the subject matters there. And therefore, in this context, I would say, uh, I would prefer to talk about such kind of things, arcs and nodes for one dimensional things, disks and walls for two dimensional things and and donuts and st stuff like that. There is more, the list is longer. We'll, we'll have a look at them soon enough. And, but at the core of this business, there's the concept of neighborhood of points. And that's what I was showing you here. Yeah, especially if you don't, um, kind of afford to care so much about precision, and this is really the, uh, usually the case with real data. There's one way or another some some form of imprecision in your data, and then you have to um, kind of deal with it. I will show you a very very concrete example in these slides. Let me just give a flash forward. So if I asked you how many points we have in this location, what would you say? Uh, in six. a geometric sense, in this point? Oh, there are um, one point. Well, you, you want to see one point, but if we had made this shape out of one quadrilateral, one triangle and so on, how many points, how many geometric points would you see there? Three. Three points, okay. So both answers are perfect, right? So you have three geometric points, but as Hugo started, then you would prefer to see only one point, right? Because that can easily describe what you're seeing here in the picture, right? And this, is, this can be easily a matter of imprecision that can become very annoying. So you want to see one point, but in, in actual reality, there can be multiple points that are supposed to be exactly on top of each other, but they're not, right? So that can cause a lot of errors, right? So let's go back to the definition and say, this is why we, we have to start understanding what is a point neighborhood, because the point might be slightly off, and yet we don't want to lose our sense of the bigger picture. We want to still be able to understand it and keep, um, keep it accurate, even though there will be some imprecision in the description of the coordinates. And why should there be some error? What is the most fundamental reason you can assume for such errors in representing points, for instance? I talked about it briefly in the previous lecture. Computers only use flock values, so there's never an absolute, absolute exact point. Thank you, perfect answer. So with computers, you cannot really represent real numbers. So you have to re represent real numbers as floating um, uh, point decimals. And then you always have one way or another a limited number of decimals. So there's no way to represent something like pi in the most absolute sense accurately enough. So there's some, uh, so this is the most fundamental reason as to why such errors occur. There are also other reasons, mostly human reasons, why such errors occur in geometric models. And therefore, long story short, you need a, a, a notion of point neighborhood to, to keep accuracy in your models. Even if you don't need topology for anything else, you at least need topology for such, for such, uh, for such reasons. And as I said, um, there's, a, there's a more um, kind of discrete or computational or algebraic notion of topology, which uh, is also known as combinatorial topology or algebraic topology which is again about the study of topological, the so-called topological invariance or the properties that do not change under such transformations. They are called topological invariance. So the fact that this was a three manifold, the dough, the piece of dough does not change when you do these transformations. The fact that the world on top of this donut looked like a donut surface does not change when you change this. If you had neighborhoods on this donut, they will not change when you make a mug out of it. You can actually draw these neighborhoods. You can, you can make a 
rectangular grid on the donut, and then you will see that it will gradually transform with the, with the transformation that, that you're making with your fingers. If you're careful enough, you can still see those same kind of connectivity on this uh, mug, right? And that picture that I just tried to describe to you should, should give you an idea um, about the connections of these two senses of topology. So if you had these kind of neighborhoods, let's say this was uh, my plot of land and this was another plot of land belonging to one of you, then after the transformation, it would probably end up here. But the two plots of land will be still neighbors on this one as well, right? But this transformation in that sense is one-to-one. -one. And when we actually study these kind of cells and, and faces or facets, then we are actually studying um, topology in an algebraic sense, which will be about topological invariance or topological properties on combinatorial maps or maps that are consisted of what are known uh, as simply called complexes, simply shell complexes, okay? And in a way, the, the main subject matter of today are these kind of objects, the simply shell complexes, okay? We'll get to those. And the, the reason that we are bothering with these words is not just to be fancy with using uh, fancier words. The reason is that we will be actually, in fact, dealing with concepts that are not covered uh, in geometry. The concept of continuity or, uh, or neighborhood is not covered there. So we have points with uh, very precise coordinates, but vertices can represent neighborhoods with imprecise coordinates, or at least you can have a radius of uh, similarity uh, with respect to which you can consider a bunch of points as being a vertex. Uh, in the plural form, it is known as vertices or edges representing curves or arcs or other kinds of geometric features connecting these vertices or neighbors together and faces describing uh, pieces of surfaces yeah, or facets of surfaces and bodies or cells that represent the three-dimensional equivalent of those things. Okay? But okay, so this is a bit too abstract perhaps for you, but this is uh, just to let you know that the uh, the subject is actually a very broad and general subject in mathematics, and it has many applications, not only geometric or design related applications or geospatial related applications, but also other applications in, in mathematics. Even the study of polynomials can, can, uh, can be a subject matter for topology. But anyhow, so let me give you the, the most general example, which is about sets. and the kind of relations that you can, you can study on sets. And this should be also close enough to the study of points, sets of points and the relations. Because here you can imagine that these kind of uh, circles or ellipsoids are representing neighborhoods. And if you have such bigger neighborhoods in this shape, then you can actually check that the axioms of the, the so-called axioms of topology exist here. So when we are talking about a topology, in the same sense that we can call a shape a geometry, we can talk about something as a topology. So when you have such a set, you can uh, describe a topology on the set as a, as a collection of subsets, such that uh, these uh, subsets have intersections with each other that is also mentioned in the collection. And they have unions with each other that are also mentioned in the sub in the in the collection in the bigger set or in the superset. Is that a mouthful? Should I repeat? So you have a set. So initially, that that's a set of points that you have, plus two extra sets. One set that includes everything in the set, and the other set that is called an empty set, right? And then you can say that okay, what could be a topology on this set? So this could be a topology on the set, which is a valid topology, because any intersection between these uh, subsets is actually mentioned in the collection of these subsets. You can, you can give yourself some more examples. This one can be a valid topology because the intersection of these two is empty and it's mentioned in the set. 
the union of these two is, is this bigger set and is mentioned in set and so on and so forth, right? And this is the same for this one. So, but this one, I find it a bit more amusing because in this one, you can kind of see a structure. It's kind of like two links and the intersection of these two links is also mentioned as a new set in the, subs in the superset, right? So if you think of the set of one and two and the set of two and three, they have an intersection which is the neighborhood of two. And that node, which is the connection of these two sort of line-like shapes is also mentioned in the set. But these two cannot be, these two collections cannot be topologies. Why? Because the intersection of these two should have been mentioned in the set. That means we have no idea of how they're connected to each other. That is not a topology because a topology was supposed to help us understand connectivity. And this one cannot be a topology because the union of these two sets is not included in the set. And therefore, again, we don't have an, under, we don't have an explicit understanding of how, how these two relate to each other, right? So um, this is, um, um, I think easier to read uh, and follow the slides and the lecture notes, but then again, we'll have much more concrete examples pertaining to geometry. And then you have to just stay active mentally to connect the dots with the geometric constructs, okay? I hope nobody's going to sleep right now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I know, I know that this can be a bit abstract. It takes time to, to connect the dots, but that's exactly what we have to do right now. Okay, so we started our journey with this uh, kind of a, a thought experiment. So let's continue with it. So I told you that if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it's probably a duck as far as we're concerned in, in modeling, in computational modeling, right? So if you were to model such a thing as connectivity, right? And send the information about connectivity on these kind of shapes. What would be the first thing that comes to your mind? If you were to send the, the information about connectivity between sets, what would you send over a telegraph line? What's the information content? Is it okay? Whether, whether they're connected or not. Yeah. Do we have the answer on the picture on, I mean, on the screen here? So can this be that description? Yeah, in the form of nested lists. So um, yeah, it's on the screen. Yes, so exactly. And uh, yeah, some kind of a dictionary or a list of lists in a way, right? That kind of shows us this topology, but can it be even more explicit? If you had called these sets something else, like with A, B, C, and D, just start thinking about that, right? Because that, that could even be closer to what we're going to talk about. So somehow it's possible to extract what we, what we need, the information content from these ones, especially if these objects have labels, then it will be even easier to talk about the connections with each other, right? So let's look at, I'm going to skip these slides and just leave them for you to read because I want to get to something more important. If you were to send the information about the connectivity of this object, what would you send? So if this was called, uh, a set of points and you had these numbers, how would you send the, the information about the connectivity between these points over a telegraph line? Um, you would say zero is connected to both one, two, and three, and the same goes for the one and to the, for the two. Could, could there have been another topology? That's a perfect answer, by the way. I mean, we had a, if we had a bunch of points, so imagine the other person on the other side of the line doesn't see the picture that you see, right? So you're in a way trying to kind of describe the picture, right? 
So could there have been another sort of topology in the, in the same set of points? Yeah, but just don't start at zero, start at one, for example. Mm -hmm. But so isn't that the same uh, as asking, could there have been another picture between these points, right? Another kind of connecting. And you can uh, easily imagine that it could have been something else, right? It could have been just a, a quadrilateral like this, right? That would be also a valid topology, but it would have been a different shape altogether, right? So if you want to describe this shape and distinguish it from this shape, then you have to describe this topology exactly as Sander said, right? So zero is connected to this and one is connected to all of them. and two is connected to all of them and so on and so forth. So this topology or this set of topological relations describes this object, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't the third statement be obsolete saying, because you already said the, they were connected to zero, one and two? So saying three is connected to one, two, and three is already said in the previous information. That's uh, very smart, yes. Uh, in, in actual reality, we would use a, 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 a data model that is much more efficient than this. So this is called adjacency lists in, as a graph representation. In practice, you will be using um, a sparse matrix for that representation, which will be more efficient in the sense that if you're always talking about uh, bi-directional relations, if you describe one, then it means that you have already described the other one. So you can cut it into a half, but that will be the subject of the next lecture. But just because you mentioned it, I cannot help myself, but to mention it. So there would be even a cleaner way to describe this set of relations as a matrix, right? Zero, one, two, three, zero, one, two, three. Right, and then you can say, okay, sorry for the terrible drawing. I even bought myself a, a digital pen for, for online teaching, but uh, I hope I'm not showing the brand, but it turned out to be a useful piece of technology, useless piece of technology. So it's as shaky as my hand drawing with a mouse, so. But since the subject matter is topological, we don't care so much about geometric precision. So it should be fine. So then you would write, what would you put in the matrix to describe the topology? Just ones where they intersect and zeros where they yeah. don't intersect. So if you say you have, you, have, you, have, you have made the matrix with just zeros, then you don't have to do anything if that, that um, does not exist a link between the two objects. But if it does exist, then you put a one, right? So for this one, it would be, Help me. So one, 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 right? Yeah, it would be all ones. Because one everyone. And one everywhere except, um, yeah, except the diagonal, diagonal zeros. Yeah, this is actually a weird matter why we do not mention the, the ones in, on the diagonal. It's even a philosophical discussion in mathematics, but we can talk about it if you're interested in a, in a break, in a coffee break. But for now, as Hugo said, then let's, let's assume that we don't put these things on the diagonal just because they are obviously connected to themselves, okay? But there's another way to define graphs in, in, in which you actually put ones here because they're perfectly connected to themselves. But let's not get into that philosophical description. But anyhow, so for now, as Sander kind of guessed, so it would not be really necessary to put ones here, yeah? So we can actually represent the graph by half of it, and we can make even the, the, the adjacency lists shorter, right? But we're getting too much into the topic of the next lecture, so let's get back on track. But this was, I think, useful to, to look at for now. Um, am I confusing you with jumping back and forth in the slides, or? Do you prefer a quicker version like this? Yeah. I want to manage to get somewhere by the end of this lecture, having given you the, 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 the longer story before. I think that should be fine, right? And maybe it's time for taking a break actually. So to, 
to harvest some energy from, from a cup of coffee or something for the next part. Um, again, I have my cup of tea here, so I'm here for questions. But if you want to take a break, um, shall we keep it short? Because we have a lot more to cover. Let's say 10 minutes, five minutes, um, 10 minutes. What do we do with the lunch break? Uh, there will be a lunch break, hopefully, yeah. Yes, <laughs> since it's now already, like, um, if we make it now 10 minutes, maybe, or we make it five minutes and then have a longer lunch break. Yeah, if that's fine with everybody, totally fine with me. Yeah, to have a decent long break for lunch. Yeah. But I'm more than happy to take questions uh, as I'm sitting here, but you don't have to be present. Take your break if you need to. Um, in, the, in the example of the, the, the circles within circles on the slides, um, there, there was a four mentioned in there. What, what, what does the four represent in the, yeah, Or is that uh, not accurate to the picture? No, yeah, may, maybe it's a discrepancy because I've, I've taken it from somewhere else. But this, this, this description should correspond to these shapes. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for noting. Uh, yeah, the question as well. Um, yeah, you um, described it as um, dough, um, mm -hmm. uh, the dough geometry. Yeah. But um, does the polity change when you? Um, like intersect two um, planes of a um, of a mass. If you, you know, squeeze them through each other, does it? Is that a valid thing to do? In, um, <laughs> sounds like gluing to me, right? Hmm? If they're talking about dough. Sounds like gluing the two pieces of dough together. So you rub them one uh, with the egg whites or something, and then you glue them together, right? Or you you kind of. Um, fuse them together in a way, right? That's what you're talking about, isn't it? Now, if, if you um, take a um, <clears throat> hypothetical basketball in a 3D um, environment and you, yeah. um, like in Rhino, yeah. you could um, try to pull the top and the bottom through each other and like, uh -huh. um, is that a thing to do in topology or is it just- ah, so um, you, you take a basketball and you make a rugby ball out of it, right? No, no, I can't or, describe or, it. It's um. Are you? Are you? Is, is it? Is it? Is it like a the orders flask example where it? Yeah. Intersects, if, but it um, doesn't actually intersect. Yeah. As a what? Euler's flask. Oil. Yeah, that one surface goes through another. Um, ah, okay. So I, I, a picture. maybe you're talking about the Klein bottle and things like. Yeah. That. That's oh, right. you Klein bottle. I mean that, not Euler. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so the Klein bottle actually. That's a very good question. So let me tell you this. Well, the Klein bottle in its um, um, how do you say in, in its original mathematical description should not be embedded in a three D space. So when you actually embed it in a three D space, then it is not a manifold. Mm. Right. That's so it's a truly really theoretical. That many people don't pay attention to. Right. So in. So you are embedding, that, that's the term, you are embedding a manifold in some lower dimensional space. Mm -hmm. It is a manifold in the four dimensional space, but it's not a manifold in the three dimensional space, if I'm mistaken, no, right? But mm -hmm. as you see it in those pictures, in those popular pictures, the Klein bottle, that, the bottle that uh, yeah, doesn't have an inside and outside, you can pour wine in it and, and it will hold it, right? You can actually even make it. There, there are some cool pictures of uh, such bottles made of, uh, of glass. Mm -hmm. right? uh, they're wonderful objects, but the, the fact is that they're, they're technically speaking, they're not three manifolds in, uh, they're not two manifolds in, in a 3D space. Yeah? You need to go so one dimension uh, higher for embedding oh, yeah. them in such a way that they really look like manifolds. But, um, all right. The other way to look at this, I mean, the intersections, if you ignore those intersections, mm -hmm. then you can say that, okay, as far as I'm concerned, it is a manifold. And that should be yeah. fine as well. 
Right, the the three D representation could be a topological model. I mean, if you um, try to three D print the Klein model, yeah, that is just one kind of topology. But um, yeah, okay, because so you have to make a hole in the in the bottle if you want to three D print it. But um, let me I show mean, you a more interesting. Theoretically, it yeah, it's. Mm -hmm. Tell you me. just from two to three D, right, with a Mobius strip, and then that would be viable. Yeah. Well, what's the topology of a Mobius strip? That's, um, also, um, that's a fascinating question. Shall I answer that first? Interesting. Uh, yeah. Let, why not? Let, let me let me first share this screen with you. This is a. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a Wikipedia page. Oh, wow. <laughs> Surface, and when it comes to the topology of surfaces. Mm -hmm. Well, these shapes, well, they're very, very fascinating to me because they just describe all the topological things that you need to know about spheres, mm -hmm. tori, and Klein bottles, and oh, stuff yeah. like that, right? So, but let, let, me, let me take this as an example and, and draw you uh, a more direct answer to your question about the, the Klein bottle, the, mm -hmm. the Mobius stripe. Yeah. Where did it go? Annotate, okay. So if you were to make um, a Mobius stripe, then you, all you have to do is to make these two vectors aligned. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So that means that you have a stripe of paper, you just put the two ends together, but you, then you, you twist one to, mm -hmm. to match the orientation of the other. And these two are basically free. So you're not forming a closed surface with it, right? All right. So all you have to do is to attach this one. Mm -hmm. And even more interesting than the, than the Mobius strip is a double Mobius strip uh, <laughs> that can be actually a papillon, like a bow tie, yeah? Mm -hmm. If you twist it twice, like two times 360 degrees, then yeah. you get a bow tie. A very cool bow tie if you want to be elegant. <laughs> As somebody who knows something about mathematics, you can make it. Yeah? You, you can even give it a try right now. If you have a, if you have a, um, if you have a tape. <laughs> One second. I'm trying to be creative right now, <laughs> but I have. So a Mobius stripe like this. Mm -hmm. And if I twist it. Well, it doesn't look so nice because it's not so flexible, but this will be the bow tie I'm talking about, which could go perfect. Okay. And how would you um, draw that in a topological um, representation like um, you drew on the Wikipedia page? What would be the diagram for um, that? That's a fascinating question. I hadn't thought about this because the twist, uh, the angles do not change the topology at no. all. So it would be... It would just be the same as bringing a circle, you know? Yeah, it actually ends up being... Maybe it's actually... Let me, let me draw the, the vectors on this piece of paper and give it a test. <laughs> It would just pretty much be a straw, right? What? A straw. A straw oh, with the, a um, yeah. yeah. So let me see. Well, if I twist them once, then the two vectors end up being opposite, right? As I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I twist them one more time, then they end up being yeah. unidirectional. So in that sense, it, it is kind of indistinguishable from uh,
from as well the bow tie, my mm. beloved bow tie will be indistinguishable from this. Interesting. Which will be also some kind of a bow tie, right? <laughs> old fashioned one, this more suitable for a preacher, right? So, uh, yeah, there but, is a difference, right? It, uh, yeah, there is a difference. In drawing, it looks the same, but it, yeah. it isn't the same topology. Yeah, well, it is the same in the, in the sense of topology as we're concerned about, but maybe the difference is in the not theory. The, oh, interesting. Like but to be honest, I, I have not paid attention to this before <laughs> so i have to think about it it's a fascinating question a uh, question yeah? if you're attaching them doesn't it mean you're actually gluing them so it wouldn't mean like there would be a distortion right yes yes we are, we are actually talking about topological tricks right now so they're all okay <laughs> well i thought maybe that's the difference why um even if they are uni, it wouldn't matter mm -hmm. because it's a distortion since you've glued them. Maybe that's the rule for that. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting angle. Indeed, it doesn't have to be the same after you glue them together. So even this one. Uh, okay, we can see. This one is definitely different from This one, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is a closed uh, surface. This is actually a, a bow tie for a preacher like myself. But this one is, is just a stripe of paper. Yeah. So they are, I mean, with every kind of gluing and cutting, we are actually uh, committing a topological crime or, or doing a topological trick, right? So you're right. Yeah. Um, but I think with the, when it comes to the twists and the number of turns and so on, as far as I know, I could be wrong. Uh, it pertains to the not theory, if I'm mistaken. I, I wrote it in the chat. But okay, so let's, uh, if everybody's back, let's get back to... But I, I can sense from the questions that... Uh, you see why I'm interested in the subject matter of topology. It's a lot of cool objects and interesting facts mm -hmm. and phenomena that you can observe more clearly with this concepts in mind. So, and the examples from baking, by the way, come from my, my own passion for cooking and baking. And <laughs> so they're real, <laughs> more or less. <clears throat> You see my screen? Yes, okay. Well, this part, uh, I've, I've kind of included this historically always in this lecture notes to, to introduce you that these things exist, but I'm hesitant whether I should keep them in the slides or not, because sometimes people get the wrong impression that I want them to work with NEPS objects, but in fact, we don't have to do anything with NEPS objects, at least not until the end of the course, which is about shaping. Right. Nevertheless, I find them interesting to, for conveying the intuition about continuity and connectedness and, and kind of connecting some of the dots to the previous concepts that we talked about in terms of dimensionality, what could be a manifold in, in, in actual reality in, in, as in a computer model and so on and so forth. But beyond that, there's no reason to bother with these slides. So this is, these are just for your information, right? But yeah, it, it could be interest, could have been interesting if we had much more time, but uh, for the time being, let's, let's keep it like this. So you, you, you will look at them, you will read them, and if you're interested, you will ask me questions, but I will not, I will not get into the gory details of nerves. Yeah, I can do that, but we have bigger fish to fry, okay? Maybe the only thing that, that can be a motivation for reading them in the weekend um, instead of one, one more episode of a TV series on Netflix is uh, to see that you can literally see in the case of nerves, patches and so on, that, that uh, you really get this feeling that topologically you can transform them and you can, you can, you can keep the, the coordinate reference system um, 
which is distorted but but still manageable to 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 do transformations back and forth and that all kinds of surfaces even this this kind of a surface like a spherical surface can be made in the same rectangular way right so that's kind of the the blessing or the, um, the interesting thing about nerves right but since we are not so much concerned about shapes for now, then you don't have to worry about it. But there's one, maybe one more interesting message. So even if you wanted, for, for some reason, you badly wanted to make something like this. Yeah. So my strong recommendation to you would be to first design it like this and then do the transformation. Because here you can much more easily make your decisions. And so this can be a, a source of hope that, yes, there are some magical tricks to, to transform this into this. But making a decision as to why here should be some object is a more abstract matter that can be much more easily handled on the rectangle. And in that sense, all surfaces are rectangles, or all of them can be quadrilateralized, so you can think about these patches of rectangles and so on. Right? Just keep this as a, as a piece of advice or a part of the ceremony in your mind, right? Okay. Um, okay. So back to the point, um, well, maybe one more thing about why I'm not getting to the nerves or why I'm hesitating nowadays, especially about them is that they're, they're uh, yeah, overly emphasized in the so-called parametric design and because it's, it's mainly a, a, a business pertaining to shapes and these things such as curvature and, and so on, yeah, they kind of exist in topology, but they're not the real subject matters that, that we have to deal with. And sometimes the NEVS models give us the, the, uh, the, the illusion that, that we are dealing with continuous shapes and continuous geometries. Whereas in reality, especially when it comes to decision-making, um, I cannot stress this uh, strongly enough that when it comes to decision making, it's almost always about discrete decisions and discrete decisions are much easier to make on such discrete representations and we should not delude ourselves into thinking that we are dealing with continuous geometry because we are working with a digital computer to begin with, right? So digital decision making, discrete decision making is going to be a lot easier than decision making on geometry and, and shapes, yeah? but you can just trust me. Uh, I think you, you kind of have to trust me, but I can assure you, reassure you that you can definitely make any shape that you like once you have made your decisions with the help of such, such tools, okay? So for now, don't worry about shapes. So as I said, we uh, um, kind of looked at uh, this extensive terminology of the words that you need to, to uh, the terms that you need to refer to when you are in different contexts, like namely different geometric contexts or topological contexts and so on. Uh, so now having shown you at least some pictures of these so-called nerves objects or spline based objects, you, you, can, you can have an idea uh, about how you can uh, kind of try to, to mimic the geometry of these continuous surfaces in, in it in a computer, but then the, the more interesting sorts of models that, that give us more opportunities for designing configurations and, and making decisions, discrete decisions are the so-called piecewise linear models or polygon meshes. So we, we will not be dealing with parametric surfaces anymore. We just say goodbye to them and maybe we will resurrect them at the end if we need to do some interesting things with shapes, but for the time being, as far as I'm concerned, you don't have to worry about them. And so we go directly into the piecewise linear models. And these are the central objects of study from now on, um, or even the simpler versions of those. But the reason we call these simplex, uh, these kind of object, object simplexes or simplices is that they're the simplest objects of these dimensions that you can think of, right? You may disagree with me and say that actually this is somewhat simpler for a two-dimensional object and this is somewhat simpler for a three-dimensional object. I won't argue with you why you say that because we would also prefer to work with these objects and in actual reality, we will be dealing mainly with pixels and voxels. But from a mathematical point of view, this one has one more vertex than this one. 
to be a two-dimensional face. And therefore, in a way, this is simpler. Yeah. And in one more important way, it is simpler. And this one has eight vertices, and this one has only four vertices. So I hope you agree with me that this is somewhat simpler, at least in terms of the mathematical description here, you have only four vertices and you can capture a volume with them. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? But actually someone got this idea and they made a fortune out of it. They got very, very successful with Tetra Packs. I don't know if you're old enough to remember such things, but I'm old enough to remember that milk was available in tetra packs, tetrahedral shapes. I think nowadays you have some kind of icy, uh, icy uh, fruit snacks available in tetra packs, longer ones, right? So why is it so interesting? So you have only four vertices. This is like the simplest shape with which you can, arguably this is the simplest shape with which you can, you can bound a volume, right? in the sense of pouring milk into it, right? So you have only a continuous host of paper, tetra pack paper that the name has become so famous that I think those kind of papers like multi-layer laminated papers are sometimes called even tetra pack papers. Is that you have this continuous host of this tetra pack paper, you can just repeatedly um, glue it on this side and the other opposite uh, side and so on and so forth. And then you have a very, very quick production line for packing milk, right? It cannot be quicker than this. So the, the throughput is really, really e efficient. And with a, with a, yeah, with a small amount of paper actually, yeah? So you can um, wrap and contain a lot of milk with this host of paper, yeah? So this is this should be proof because there can be milk inside. This is proof that this is a three-dimensional object and it has a volume contained inside, right? And it's not a pyramid. This has nothing to do with the pyramids in Giza, in Egypt, and so on, right? This is a tetrahedron. Tetrahedron is a Greek word for four facets, uh, an object with four facets, a polygon with a polyhedron or a multifaceted object with four facets, tetra for that, right? So in that same sense, we call... Um, a, a box, a hexahedron in a topological sense. Let me just draw it hastily because you can see that it has one, two, three, four, five, six facets. Then it's called a hexahedron. Yeah. And this is a triangle, the, the good old triangle. And why is it simpler than this one? Can you think of one more reason? I mean, not just because it has one less set of coordinates or vertices, vertex. What could be simpler in a triangle than a quadrilateral? Again, for the same reason that we call this hexahed um, hexahedral or a hexahedron, we call this a quadrilateral or, or, or a quad sometimes to distinguish it from a square. A square is a, is a geometric concept, right? So in, as far as topology is concerned, this one and this one are the same. They're both quadrilaterals, right? So can you think of one more reason why this is simpler than this? If I were to make this out of dough, yeah? at least in three dimensions and only using piecewise linear geometry, yeah? having straight lines here means that the triangle itself will be definitely a planar piece of surface. Yeah? And any point inside the triangle can see any other point inside the triangle, right? But this one can easily become twisted. So you have three points on the table, This is a piece of dough, right? Still a quadrilateral. So even if you have these straight edges, then it can easily be a twisted quadrilateral.
See what I'm getting at? And then there's, there will be some kind of a break line. Yeah. Yeah. So this one is simpler. And then this is the mathematical proof. You remember we talked about the, the a line being a locus of points um, as multiples of uh, a vector plus another vector. So remember this, I said that a line can be conceived as a, a locus of points. You can start from anywhere you like. Let's call this P0 as a vector. And let's call this B for direction, right? So the entire line as a locus, as a mathematical location can be said to be P equal to P0 plus some alpha times D. This is a vector, this is a vector, this is a vector, this is a scalar, yeah? Can be any scalar in the range of real numbers. Right? Then with positive scalars, you would go in this direction on the line. So just give it a try. Two times D will be this, right? So two times D gets you here. Negative one times D gets you here. And all kinds of real numbers multiplied by D get you somewhere on this line, right? As simple as that. But if, if you do this for a triangle, what do you get? So if I, if I argue that this describes a triangle, would you agree with me in a way? How can this describe the triangle? So alpha zero times V zero, let's call this V zero, V one and V two. And let's imagine that there's a coordinate reference system here. And these are just three vectors. Anything wrong with that, right? No. Okay, so please excuse my shaky drawings again, but you can, I, you can imagine what I'm getting at. So if alpha, uh, alpha zero, alpha sub one, and alpha sub two are kind of decided in such a way that they, are, they add up to one, any combination as, as this one, this is by the way called a linear combination, will be a point in the middle of the triangle. You can also think of more interesting combinations, like when one of them is positive, one is negative and so on. And they will describe you all the regions in the space around these points on the same plane, by the way. On the same plane that this triangle kind of indicates, right? And that's a very fascinating point. That's called convexity. So this, this so long as these alpha um, coefficients add up to one, then you have a convex shape. Convex, what's the meaning of convex? Convexity is this, this fact that any point inside can be actually constructed as a linear combination of all these. And more intuitively, it also means that any point on this uh, locus can see any other point in this locus, right? I mean, and, and I mean seeing as in literally seeing visibility. So if you had a garden station here, let's say in an art gallery, the, the guard in the gallery could potentially s turn 360 de degrees and watch over all the paintings on the walls of this room, right? But if you draw a room like this, how many guards do you need for this gallery? Uh, two. Probably the answer is, is, is going to be somewhat more complicated. It's actually known as the art gallery problem. You can look it up on Wikipedia. But that when you say two, then, then something more interesting pops up. These shapes are not exactly convex, but they can be said to be star convex. What is star convex? Star convex is a shape like an egg in which there's something like an egg yolk. So if you place a guard in this region, which I call the egg yolk, the guard can see everything from this region, but the guard cannot be in this region or in this region. 
So it's not exactly convex yet, right? But it has something to do with the, the shape of a star. I don't know if I managed to make a star shape, convex shape. So if you take the intersection of all of these, then you can kind of find out where the York can be. So this can be a very uh, artistic shape for a baked egg, yeah? So there's a York from which the, the whole egg white is visible and it looks like a kind of a star. So you can try it with the Star of David, you can try it with the five, uh, five pointed star and so on. Yeah? There, in all of them, there's this region, but these with simple complex uh, convex shapes, this is really easy because, I mean, you can easily see that any point in this shape can, can see any other point in the region. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's connect two very, very important dots. There's a there's a formal description as to what can be a simplicio complex. Okay, you might be wondering, okay, how, why do I need to worry about these terms? But there's something very important in this definition. If you're not comfortable with the terms, don't worry about it. Just, just pay attention to this fact that there's something a bit annoying about this one on the right. Yeah. If you think about topological constructs, and what do you think that is? If you wanted to describe the relations between these elements in these two shapes, I would say there's no problem. In this shape, there's some kind of a problem. What is that problem? Uh, the points don't align. So mm -hmm. um, it's difficult to um, to describe where the second triangle is located on the uh, edge of the first triangle. Yeah, and can you, perfect. So can you relate it to the description of uh, a topology that I gave before? Um, Question. How would you call this point? Uh, there's a vertex here, and there, there seems to be some kind of an intersection, doesn't it? Oh, it's glued. Or um... yeah, but but okay. Let, let's think about it. There seems to be an intersection here, right? Mm -hmm. But you kind of have no direct way of saying where that is. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, these are like two triangles that have nothing to do with each other, right? Yeah. So somewhere they appear to be connected, but I have no way of transmitting that information over a telegraph line and, and describing to someone what, what I'm dealing with. Yeah. yeah. But what if you describe the distance and the angle? Like, wouldn't you be able to point out where um, the next point is nearby? Yeah. That's a good one, but that, that, that would be a geometric description for which we need to give so many instructions how to get there. But I'm talking about the most compact set of information that can describe the kind of shape, the kind of situation we are dealing with in terms of only connectivity, connectedness, neighborhoods, adjacencies, etc. right? So the information content is different from geometric information. So I want to know if this is the, for instance, the, the plot for the house of someone, and this is the plot for the house of someone else, if they're exactly neighbors or not, right? And just keep, keep your answer in your mind and then, so, and keep also my question in your mind. So we want to tell if these two triangles are actually neighbors or not, right? I can probably get this information, the geometric information from looking at this picture, but Remember that the computer doesn't see what we see and we want to help the computer kind of see some properties, right? And it doesn't have eyes, right? So we, we can come up with a way to describe such relationships without all the time drawing pictures. Even if we manage to draw the picture accurately, a human can, can read from the drawing, a computer cannot. Well, if it manages to read from the drawing, it has to manage to read some other kind of information to answer a question about adjacency or neighborhoods or connectivity. Yeah? 
So let's let's see uh, what this entails. So these are these two simple rules. So uh, every if if we want to call it a valid simplicial complex, then we say that every face of a simplex of um, um, every face is a simplex, and the intersection of every two simplices or simplexes is uh, is a simplex of one dimension lower than those two. Okay. So in this case, this is a simplex of degree two, which is a face or, or a triangle. This is a simplex of degree two, and their intersection is a line that is mentioned as a simplex of degree one, right? So we have all the information to talk about their connectivity. Can, um, may, maybe I, I need a volunteer, but may, maybe I can point my finger to Sander and, and say, you describe the other one, how would you describe this shape? as a graph. Oh, anyone else who wants to volunteer? Tangent? Mm -hmm. Tangent? Tangent? Yes. Okay, that's, uh, yeah, again, a, a geometric construct, but connecting back to the description that Sander gave in the other slide. So do, do you mean the middle one or the, the right one? Yeah, this one. So let's, let's start with labeling again. So zero, one, two, three. You know, you, you would say that one is connected to zero, two, and three, uh, and that zero is only connected to one and two, and three is only connected to one and two. Okay, so suppose then, we write all those descriptions. Um, those descriptions actually pertain to the study of this line network, right? Can you think of something of a higher dimension to describe the fact that there is something like a facet here? Um, maybe that um, two points of one triangle are the same as two points of the other triangle, which means... Um, that's, that's close enough, yeah. Yeah. But you know, they share one uh, edge. Mm -hmm. But okay, back to the, the original question, how would you describe the triangle itself? Um, the middle shape, or um, yeah, what points that are connected to each uh, that are like connected to one of each other? Mm -hmm. or, uh, okay, A anybody else? Would it would Liva? <laughs> I have to. <laughs> would would a triangle be defined as something where? Uh, it is a simplex of the yeah. points given. Yeah, Ge geometrically yes. yeah. yeah, But if you were to just transmit over a telegraph line and the clock is ticking and something is, is going to explode, what, what would you send over the tri a telegraph line about the triangle? To only, only know yeah, which you, one is the triangle. You just want to say that there is a triangle and you're in Second World War and it's, it's really urgent and you have to really describe the triangle. What would you say? Telegraph. Um, three points. Yeah. And tell this triangle. Yeah. And what would you say about those three points? They are connected to um, every other point. So. If it's triangles, then. Um, believe it every or not, point I'm, is... I'm old enough to remember uh, a telegraph message. <laughs> so it used to be actually cheaper than telephone. And I've seen it, so you had to actually pay for every single word, right? So what would be the most compact telegraph message that you, you could send? So the three points. Yeah. What about them? Uh, the coordinates. Coordinates or something better? If you can manage to send the coordinates once, so zero, one, two, three. They have coordinates, so you, you manage to send the coordinates, rough coordinates, once. And mm -hmm. the next time you want to describe connectivity, you just have to refer to them as that point, right? Mm -hmm. That point that I previously sent the coordinates, previously sent you the coordinates. For. So one, two, and three, that would be a triangle, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So zero, one, and two would be another. So these two sets kind of describe what, what we're looking at. Don't you agree? Right? And what uh, Hugo said earlier can be easily 
seen from this image, isn't it? If you just think about the intersection of these two sets, what would that be? That would be another set. I mean, I'm really talking about the two sets, two abstract sets and their intersection. What would that, that would be, be a set that contains one and two. Exactly. So, and that equals, I call it an edge, right? So now I, it should be a lot easier to connect the dots with what I showed you earlier. So now we are dealing with sets that only contain integers. That's very, very, very important, right? And that makes things super easy, right? Because if I ask you a question whether like these two numbers are equal to each other, that would be some kind of a philosophical question, right? Wouldn't you agree? But whether two and two are the same, that's not a philosophical question. That's a very easy question to answer, right? So dealing with integers is a lot more fun than dealing with such float numbers. So you don't have to worry about the coordinates anymore. You've sent them once over the telegraph line. And from now on, you can just keep calling them with the labels. And these labels happens to be, happen to be integers, right? These whole numbers, which are very, very easy to work with. Right, And then these intersections can be formed and then you have a perfect description of the shape as far as the, the, the connectivity is concerned, right? Then also, because you have once sent the, the, the coordinates in a separate list and you don't have to repeat yourself so many times, you know, if you were to send coordinates, then you, ha you would have to send two sets of how many coordinates for these two triangles? We're talking about efficiency of communication and information content. Four coordinates in total. How many? Four in total. No, but four sets of coordinates. So in fact, how many float numbers? Let's say 12 numbers, right? Something like that? No. Yeah, so in the topological way, you have to send only 12 numbers once and only once, right? In the geometric way, you have to send once for this triangle, three times three, that is nine, and three times three for the other. And now imagine you have a, I don't know, a hundred triangles. Would be super inefficient and very likely to be erroneous. You know, there can be many ways things can, things can go wrong, you know? So you describe a triangle, uh, you describe the other triangle. So in, the, in describing the other triangle, something slightly goes off and then you end up here. And then you lose completely any sense of connectivity. And believe me or not, this is something that's happening every day in all kinds of geographical models, geometric models, things uh, go wrong and there's, and sometimes you don't see them with your, with naked eyes and then you have to zoom in and then see, oh, okay. They're kind of far apart. Everything looks okay on the, on the, pic, on the screen. When you zoom in, then you see that there are problems. Things that are supposed to match somewhere, they do not match, et cetera, et cetera, yeah? That's one of the reasons uh, I'm kind of, um, yeah, to put it mildly, um, I'm a bit tired of geometric models and I'm much more comfortable with topological models, right? Because you don't have to worry about such, um, yeah, annoying businesses, yeah? So let's let's continue with this. Um, I think I think now you should be able to really connect the dots. This point in the slides and, and the previous point about sets, and it should be much less abstract now. Why we started with that definition and how that pertains to the practice of computational design and computational geometry modeling and so on and so forth. Right. For your information, that the um, there are models of space which have to have these um, three-dimensional cells or bodies modeled topologically as well. So it's not only limited to the patches of surfaces that we are, we are simplifying with triangles uh, or quadrilaterals and so on, right? There could also be models of the chunks of space as cells or bodies also modeled topologically. How? You, you have seen them already. The tetrahedron that we talked about is one of such uh, cells could be one of such cells, right? 
but we prefer again voxels or pixels we will get to those details later you will see that the poor bunny has been constructed from lego from trahedrons from many many different kinds of things this bunny is the kind of the most famous model in computer geometry right so everybody's dissecting the bunny in some way to to make a point about geometric modeling yeah i don't know if it was a real bunny or the statue of a bunny anyhow so what 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 can you think of as for a reason to to model the cells in space the tetrahedral cells or the the voxelated cells or I mean, why bother if we, if you want to just look at the bunny and how it looks, then just having the surface is enough, right? I mean, if, if it's if it's only meant to be visualized as a bunny and, and you want to make a chocolate for, for Easter from it and so on, it, it's fine, right? But what if you want to study the, the composition of the bunny from the inside? Let's say it's, it's a... It's an Easter bunny, a chocolate Easter bunny that is really full of chocolate. It's not just a layer of chocolate. And there are different sorts of chocolate compositions inside, right? Then if you want to have a replica of that in, in, in a computer, you have to have also some things to refer to as that part of the bunny, the other part of the bunny, etc., right? Then the best thing that you can think of from, from a topological point of view is this set of tetrahedrons, each of which describe a chunk of three-dimensional space, right? There can be milk here, there can be hazelnut, there can be, you know, it's something three-dimensional of substance, right? Okay, but as I said, so we prefer to work with uh, good old pixels and voxels. In, in this course, so you don't have to worry so much about tetrahedron models, but for your information, they do exist, and we we refer to similar constructs for um, for dealing with them. But we are not going to be dealing specifically with uh, simplicial complexes. This is more of a general concept that you have to know. We will be talking much more in detail about pixel um, models and voxel models and what you can do with them. Even in the workshop of the afternoon, you will be dealing with connectivity in pixel models and voxel models for making something really cool, which is called a cellular automata. Yeah? But for now, just let's only focus on uh, the underlying concepts. Okay, so back to this business, I already bothered you with a question. How would you send the information over a telegraph line? Let's recapitulate what, what uh, we have been talking about so far. And let's see more clearly why, why it is beneficial to make topological models or model topology explicitly in a geometric model. So again, I need uh, volunteers to describe me what is wrong with modeling this object as a bunch of triangles. Hugo and Sander have, have responded many quest, uh, to many questions, so I'm looking for other volunteers. If you don't answer, I will have to. Maybe because of the inaccuracy at the corners. Mm -hmm. It's a very good just one. just explained. Yeah. And can someone else continue with, with what Marcia said uh, in terms of inefficiency of Storage. Lotte. Maybe too many connections. Hmm? Who is it? Sam? Okay, okay Sam. Uh, maybe too many connections on the, uh, the intersections. For instance, here. Yeah, like too many numbers. Okay, and what does that entail in terms of efficiency of storing the data? Um, well, it will cost a lot of data because you have to write a lot of numbers. Okay, so for, as an example, at this point, if you were to describe this location, you would have to write that location how many times? One, two, three, four, six, five, seven, eight times. You would have to describe the same set of coordinates, the same point, right? So what else? Is it only about points or? 
Yeah. And maybe all the also the lines of the triangles are exactly uh, the same because exactly. uh, two triangles uh, next to each other are the same line. Exactly. Thank you. So thank you for all the answers. So let's say that 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 bunch of triangles, by the way, is called the triangle soup, right? If you ever hear that term. And there are so many reasons why it is not a good idea to, to model this object as a triangle soup. But there might be only one good reason to, to do it that way. If your only purpose is to see a bunch of triangles, that will be the fastest way to, to visualize them. If you have one triangle and you need a method to make it look like a triangle, what would that be? A method to visualize it with a bunch of pixels on your screen, right? And that method, method can efficiently work with one triangle at a time. Yeah? But that's about the only reason I can think of for having it as a bunch of triangles, right? For every other reason I can think of, especially reasons related to any kind of analysis, simulation, or computational design, I would very much prefer to have the triangles described as these kind of constructs, because that would be super efficient. You would have to only model this many points or vertices, in fact, and then edges in between them can be just called with, can, can, you, can you guess how the edges will be written? Anybody? Maybe as an E1 and then two points. So yes, um, you have E1 T1, be, yeah, zero, one. zero, fourth, yeah. Exactly. Right? So, and these, you, you can immediately see that these can be the intersections between these objects, right? And E1, because it's not uh, the intersection of any two objects, then it can easily be detected by a computer who does not not even have to look at the picture that E1, if it's described this way, must be part of a boundary of this object, right? Because it's only apparently connected to one triangle. That's another immediate advantage. So you can, well, even though the computer cannot see the image, it can really see such things very, very quickly from looking at these sets of integers, right? So zero and one, obviously this is going to be a part of the boundary. And let's say, let's say if we have E2, which is one and four, It is obviously an edge shared between these two polygons, right? And therefore it cannot be part of the boundary, right? And if there was something like this, then let me challenge you a little bit because I think this is fun. If there was another face here, um, that fact could have been observed, right? That there, there existed another phase, like, I don't know, six and seven. Yeah. And can you think of this as a piece of dough? And imagine if such a thing could have been made from a disc that you had prepared for pizza or pie. I don't think so. What's wrong with it? Yeah, you'd have to glue the new part on it. Yeah, so or... the, the piece of dough that is prepared as a disc for pizza, do you agree with me that it's perfectly fine to call it a manifold, a two manifold, right? Yeah. Even if you hold it with your hands, it will take some relaxed shape and so on. But at any time, um, um, you, can, you can see that this is a two manifold. You know, if there are small bacteria living on that... Uh, well, the bacteria living on that piece of dough, they are walking on this two-dimensional surface. And for them, the whole world looks like a flat world, right? Mm -hmm. And they're stuck to the, to the piece of dough, right? Um, but it remains a two-dimensional manifold, a two-manifold. But this one cannot be possibly made out of that disk without gluing a piece. So that there's something wrong with this one, right? Well, not exactly wrong, but some, some kind of an anomaly that makes it difficult to call it a two-dimensional object because around this line, you can see that it's connected to three facets, to three planes, right? 
And that makes it very, very difficult to even approximately call it a two-dimensional plane. And that makes it non-manifold. And even such a, such a quirky, geeky little detail can be observed from the fact that this edge will be shared between three faces. Yeah? So all kinds of information pertaining to the topology of this shape, the manifoldness, the connectivity, et cetera, et cetera, can be observed from these sets. That's why we bothered with that uh, very abstract definition of topology at the beginning. Yeah? You having a good time? Yeah? <laughs> okay, is it getting better? Yeah? So, um, and then again, another, another nice thing about it is that once you have this description, if you need to transform the shape in this way or in any other more interesting way, actually, which is called shape optimization, I've given you a reference in the lecture notes. You might say that, okay, this piece of dough right now is not comfortable. Let's, let's hold it between a, a few things and, and let's make it nicer piece of dough, or it can be even a piece of cloth that you, you kind of harden somehow and you make, a, you make an interesting shell out of it. That's what Gaudi did for the, the Church Sagrada Familia, by the way. He, he actually made that with some kind of a fishnet constructed out of uh, wires and stuff like that. So that's kind of like shape relaxation or shape optimization, if you will, which will give you um, an elliptic geometry of this kind. Yeah, so that will take you to, to, to the realm of elliptic geometry. If you make a soap bubble between such edges, you will get to these kind of geometries or, and then you will enter immediately into the realm of hyperbolic geometry. Yeah, if you work with such topological constructs on, on other generalized networks, then um, like an urban network and so on, then you are in the realm of uh, network studies or graph theory as easily as that, right? So that's the cool thing about topology. So it, in fact, it's, it kind of stands for me at least above geometry at this point in time. This I already talked to you about. I skipped this uh, little detail, but just for your information, you can even make such topological descriptions even more compact by, by just making bigger constructs, bigger than a triangle, you can call a fan or a star of triangles and a stripe of triangles and so on and so forth, right? And this issue related to the border, I, I just told you about. So if you see that an edge is only mentioned once in one face, that it has to be part of the border, right? As simple as that. And that, um, yeah, this issue of the non-manifold border, you can also detect it with topology. And, and now talking about non-manifold as in... a very rough description of this as a piece of dough. But since this is mostly a shape that is um, elongated more than it's uh, widened, then you can you would like to think about it as a one-dimensional shape. If I was making some kind of loop-like shapes for, for biscuits or dough, then it would be easy to consider them as just a single loop, a curve. But for this shape, there's no easy way to, to think about a one-dimensional description. Because here again, we have an anomaly. This is not exactly a one-dimensional shape anymore, right? But for this one, for a snake, again, baked snake, or any such elongated shape, then you can easily think of them as a one-dimensional object, but this one cannot be considered a one-dimensional object because of this point. But again, that's something you can approximately see here, that this could easily be a snake eating its own tail. Yeah, this is the head of the snail. 
eating its own tail. Yeah? Or this description. Yeah? And this object, when we say that it does not have any border, what do we mean? Anybody? Well, every edge here appears to be part of at least two faces, right? It's probably not a fair question because I have not shaded the faces of these objects. Well, in this case, I, I should have shaded this. But to be fair, I'm talking about the shaded object, the surfaces, the facets, right? Can you imagine inflating this object? Imagine I've made this out of dough and I've somehow managed to put it in a freezer like this. And now uh, I, I let it thaw a little bit and then I bring a straw and I start inflating this. What will be the shape after the inflation? The simplest shape it can take after inflation. One thing about dough, by the way, have you noticed that? Well, let's say you make a dock with a piece of dough right? It's a fresh piece of dough for pizza, but just because you want to have some fun, you make a duck out of it. Okay, sorry for my drawing, but let's, <laughs> let us assume that this is a duck. You put it on the, on the kitchen, kitchen top, uh, tabletop, and then you leave it for one hour. As you come back, what will be the shape? The dough has risen, and then what will be the, the shape? Yeah. Like a ball. Yeah, that, that's why we are talking about these kind of terms. You let it be for one hour, you come back, you will find it as a ball. Had you made a cow out of it or any other animal for that matter, it would have converted into a ball again, right? Just give it enough time and let it relax. It will be a ball because it is a ball, topologically speaking, right? There are some cool pictures of uh, um, cartoonish cows and ducks and so on inflated into a, a ball, a completely spherical ball. And you can see that this is the same story, right? So if you inflate it and you let it be, or, or you, you, let's say you make this piece of dough and you even cut this or somehow mark these edges and you let it be for one hour, then it rises, right? Then it will be a ball with the same kind of lines on top of it. What happens like with the donut shape? Um, if you inflate that, at the, if you inflate it big enough, the hole will close. How okay. do you, that's a, that's so, a like, but then the topological uh, uh, type changes. How does that? Ah, so at that critical moment when the, maybe, maybe it reaches to a point where the, there is no hole anymore, right? Yeah. You're talking about? Yeah. And also um, I had kind of the same question with the six um, pictures of the uh, dots that grow like at some point, the topological uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, yeah, yeah, picture yeah, changes, yeah, yeah. and how do you? Yeah. Exactly, um, that, that uh, let me go back to it. Well, here, in fact, the, 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 the main question is about topology, this one you mean, right? Yeah? Is that so, Marcia? You were talking, you were asking about this one, right? I can't, I can't hear you. You're muted. Uh, well, the topology like changes if you make the, like the circles bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, but that is the thing that you should do to test the topology. Okay. That's, that's a very good question. So let me, let me tell you why we want to model this topology in the first place, right? I, I kind of mentioned it implicitly. I said that, for instance, imagine that, uh, I know, imagine you always do your shopping at Jumbo or Albertine or what, whichever, right? And I want to find out based on your profile that is represented as a data point with some, I don't know, six, eight, 12 uh, characteristics, what will be the, the next items in your shopping list, right? And here's someone else, you know, the question, will be how do you detect similarity between two profiles, you know? You know that the, the, the idea of the, the, Euclidean, the Euclidean distance generalizes easily to higher dimensions, right? 
that that we've talked about right then the question is 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 there any kind of shape that relates all these apparently unrelated profiles to each other and why should even we be interested in that shape the the, the answer is if we have that shape if we have the shape of the donut if there are places for which we don't have yet a profile recorded then we can interpolate between the existing ones on that shape right so we can guess and predict how would be the shopping basket of that person for whom we have not yet recorded uh, something but it appears that that person might be in between two other persons in that sense right these kind of questions right so the manifold in this case will make it much easier to interpolate between the data points right and that's that's why it's some kind of a very sought after thing to to make a manifold representation from higher dimensional da data and yes indeed the picture will be different uh, with every different sense of similarity or proximity between the data points right um however that uh, the, that definition of similarity has something to do with the nature of the data points in question right so that will be an engineering matter like how do you do that right how, how do you detect similarity? What, what's the right picture to look at right and none of them is totally wrong by the way right so when when you don't care so much about the details they're all apparently kind of similar to each other wouldn't you agree somehow if there was another chunk of such points somewhere further away in space then relatively speaking this bunch of points would have been similar as compared to the other bunch of points which is like two meters away from here right so even this picture is correct but then the more you care about precision that the, the better should be your definitions of similarity and proximity and that's how you get to the perfect answer for the interpolations yeah and uh, okay so as far as the, the in inflation and we're not talking about inflation as in economics but uh, inflating this uh, kind of funny objects can, can you also guess what would be the shape of this one if the the facets were some somehow slightly flexible i've seen many kids actually playing with this empty empty pockets you inflate it it becomes more or less like a sphere as well right yeah so if the kid is powerful enough then they can they can make it a sphere just have to try really hard right because it is a sphere in its nature or from a topological point of view we call it a ball the surface right okay but so this kind of stuff i i already told you about this one you can even detect whether something can be a, a good approximation of a manifold or not we're talking about approximations of manifolds from now on and you can see easily that this is not a manifold this is not a manifold there's something wrong with this and you can detect all of those things by doing some integer computations using those set descriptions of faces edges and vertices okay before we continue then then let me tell you one more thing about why we bother with these different terminologies what do you think is the difference between a point and a vertex a vertex is an orientation not exactly what do you mean by orientation um what well, could go from the one point right it depends if you look at it as a relationship between the two or as a direction okay let, let, let me give you a simple a hint a simpler thing so if, if this was like a junction of roads on a hilly landscape like this one right you would give it a name most probably the junction on the peak something like that right and you would not bother writing down h points to describe the same point you would only if you called someone you would say i'm on the peak i'm on the junction of the roads on the peak right so that single name that single neighborhood which uh theoretically also includes those eight points in technical terms we could call it a pointer to those eight points pointer a pointer is like an integer so zero would be a pointer to those two points that meet at this point right 
That's the reason why we bother with calling them vertices, because in fact, they describe something other than the points in that location, right? And for similar reasons, we call this an edge. The zero four is an edge, whereas in reality, we know that there could be two lines, yeah? From here to here and from uh, vice versa, right? And for the same reason, we call this a, 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 yeah, a face rather than a triangle because a face pertains to the bigger picture. So you have a bigger graph here out of which this one is a face, right? So you have a reference to the global picture, right? That's why we don't call them polygons or lines or points anymore. We call them faces, edges, and vertices, right? So it says always something about the bigger picture, the big picture, the connectivities, the adjacencies, and so on, right? Okay, so let me wrap it up here. So since uh, we know these definitions, we know what these vertices, edges, and faces are, then, then we can even have a better insight so the computer can see things even more clearly. It can see that, for instance, this shape should be equal to the shape of what, what is the simplest shape of dough that you can imagine for this piece? The plate. Who was that? Sunday. Okay, excellent answer. How, how do you see that? Uh, well, it's hollow and it's flat, so you can bend it backwards out. Perfect. So this is actually a disc as far as I'm concerned, right? And it has a characteristic for that indicates that it is indeed a disc, right? So you can make this from a single piece of dough just by shaping it with your fingers, right? So we say in the in the geeky terms that it's homeomorphic to to a disc to a disc, right? And that can be simply detected by the so-called Euler Poincaré characteristic, which is this number: the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces is some value here, and then it ends up being equal to one for this shape and. I don't need to count because I kind of know it, but there's, this is the Euler side of the equation. This is the, I would call it, loosely speaking, the Poincaré side of the equation. This is more concerned with the global picture. The number of genera, which is the plural of genus or a whole or a handle, something with which you can handle the object. Remember this was the handle for the mug, the, do uh, the donut. The hole in the donut became the, the handle for the mug, right? So this, is, this has two of such handles. So G should be two for this object, as you can see here. And it does not have a border shown with this uh, figure, which is called del. It has a rather confusing applications in, in, in two branches of mathematics. In, in, uh, in, um, in calculus, this is used for partial derivatives, uh, partial differentials. But in the context of topology, this indicates um, borders. You know? So there is no border for this shape for the reasons that you have observed so far. Every edge in this shape is kind of covered with two faces, right? So therefore this number del will be zero for this shape. And then if you work it out from this side or the other side, it, these, num these numbers end up being the same and therefore we call them the so-called Euler Poincaré characteristics. Euler and Poincaré were both mathematicians who contributed significantly to the, to the inception of the field of topology. I'll talk more about them or let you read, but basically let me cut it here that from this point on, you can see that tessellations can be described and checked by the, by the Euler equation. And from a Poincaré's point of view, you can see that regardless of how we tessellate this in a valid way, the number always ends up being negative two for a double torus, yeah? And we can use such numbers for validity checks on, on geometric objects and, and so on. Okay, so I leave you with the slides. I will just upload them on Brightspace so you can read them for yourself and get back to me with questions, but um, let's give you this one hour for a decent lunch break. 
that okay? Okay. Tired? Angry? Hungry? Angry? Okay. 